Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. Between the ages of 30 and 50, spent the 1980s watching the American situation comedy Cheers, and wishing that we had a place where everybody knew our name. The consumption of alcohol in social settings has been a part of Western society at least since the time of the Roman Empire, and remains a part of many cultures throughout the world. The history of the consumption of alcohol. Including the history of establishments where alcohol is served and consumed, is a history of social struggle, social control, and respite from social alienation. Today on First Person Plural, we talk with history professor Sean Cafferkey about the history of drink and drinking establishments in Canada. Join us as we examine the social history of social drink. In an episode we call "Community Spirits." You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. <laughs> 
concept of social drinking has more complexity than one thinks at first. To be sure, pubs, lounges, bars, sports bars, wine bars, drinking clubs, taverns, and saloons offer various forms of entertainment along with the alcohol. Darts, billiards, betting, trivia games, jukeboxes, live music, sing-alongs, karaoke, comedy nights, sports on television screens, and other such events are considered natural activities to go along with a night of social drinking. One sports bar in Florida even has bingo on non-baseball nights during the long, slow summer off-season for tourism. Of course, there are other drinking establishments that offer more, let's say, adult forms of entertainment. However, the alcohol consumption at these places becomes less complimentary and more secondary to such entertainment activities. Certain organizations and businesses go well with drinking establishments. Hotels catering to weary travelers often have a lounge or tavern. Fraternal clubs usually have a bar for their members. Restaurants with sports themes often have a bar area for those who simply want to drink and watch a game instead of eat. Dance clubs often have bars attached to them. Even college campuses usually have a club or bar on campus for students who have reached legal drinking age and for their professors. Stadiums, of course, are another place where bars and beer stands seem natural. Beer has been made available at a price at professional baseball games for years. Participation in the ritualized purchase and consumption of beer at these games was so enthusiastic, in fact, that it became common in the mid-1980s for concessionaires to curtail sales in the seventh inning of games. Otherwise, the behavior of intoxicated customers could have created the general impression that the concessionaires benefited from an embarrassment of riches, with the emphasis on the embarrassment. But this complicated social landscape does not even scratch the surface of the importance of drinking establishments and alcohol consumption in Western culture. Who drinks, what they consume, and where they consume it is a powerful sign of social class. Stereotypes of what drink goes with what status illustrate the symbology. Beer is for the working class. Sherry is for little old ladies after dinner. Cognac and expensive scotch are for discerning upper crust tastes. Wines are divided into categories that lead to class distinctions as well. Race and ethnicity are also stereotyped into alcohol preferences. Less true today, but certainly a part of drinking history, is the distinction between men and women and their drinking habits. In Victoria, drinking halls still have doors marked ladies and their escorts from past days of segregation of drinking halls by gender. In fact, it was as late as the 1960s that women were not supposed to drink alone at bars. Men, on the other hand, were expected to drink well and drink often, buy each other rounds, and then head home each to his respective missus hopefully with enough money left over to take care of the family. Controlling alcohol consumption has been vilified in the past. In North America, temperance movements led to legal prohibition of alcohol. Throughout Canada, government ownership of the distribution of liquor has lasted for nearly 70 years, with only recent privatization in some provinces. In the U.S., several state and local governments have controlled distribution outlets at various times since the repeal of Prohibition. Drunk driving and alcoholism are considered as serious social problems that have generated many social claims leading to many social policies. Controlling alcohol consumption has been used as a way of controlling immigrant populations and minors. Controlling alcohol consumption has been at the center of discussions on other forms of drug abuse. Controlling alcohol consumption has generated trillions of dollars, American and Canadian, in tax revenues for governments over the years. But all these efforts at social control haven't made drinking alcohol go away. <laughs> 
Many believe that is because of the alienating consequences of capitalism. Drinking establishments have served traditionally as places of connection for many workers, and consuming alcohol, even in moderation, seems to take the edge off the drudgery for many. But it is not the alcohol alone that succeeds in offsetting alienation. Community connections are increasingly being seen as an important aspect of drinking in these settings. In Europe, Canada, and some of the larger cities in the U.S., the neighborhood pub is reasserting itself as a place to connect with others in one's community. Pubs are positioning themselves as centers of more than entertainment beyond the mindless varieties, with seminars, salons, book reading clubs, and poetry nights joining the more traditional forms of entertainment. Publicans are seeking to put the public back in the public house and cater to adults of various ages with various backgrounds. It is this effort towards connection and community that we want to examine today. The Strand Bay Bay Taverns returned full circle to their place as central meeting halls for their communities. There was a time in North American history when even church congregations held meetings at the local tavern. We talk with history professor Sean Cafferkey about the history of drink and drinking establishments in Canada. thinking about doing this episode about pubs and about uh, drinking establishments, I asked around and I was told by the history department at UVic that you're the drinking professor. So uh, you want to tell me why they called you that? Uh, because for the first time in the department, a course was offered on drinks and it was called Social Control in Canada, 1828 to 1928. And uh, I guess I got that reputation by taking the students out for a brewery tour, the practical as well as the theoretical. <laughs> Tell me, uh, you teach about the history of Canadian drink? That's correct. And uh, tell me a little bit about it. I take it that part of what's going on is the temperance movement during that time. Right. They track the temperance movement starting in 1828 and carry that study through until the end of Prohibition in Canada, roughly 1928, and the move away from private sector control insofar as distribution is concerned and, and look at the government regulation in the post-Prohibition era. And during that time... Um, well, tell me a little bit more about the temperance movement. Um, it sounds like it would just be just a bunch of religious people telling a bunch of other people that they shouldn't drink, but it was really more complicated than that, right? It, it was. It was part of the wider reform movement, so the suffragists would be considered part of the reform movement and the attempt to, to get women the vote, provincially and federally in the country, and there was an intimate connection between the suffragists in this country and those that were involved in, say, the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union. Mm -hmm. uh, there was overlap in terms of membership and prominent personalities in both who were members of both groups. Uh, there was, it also fits within the reform movement for changes to the penal system in terms of the justice system, in terms of education, municipal reform in the country as well. Women were seen as the uh, the social housekeepers of their communities and were taking responsibility for what was going on in their community outside of the, the four walls of their residence, and temperance fits within that. So it was directed against alcohol and the abuses thereof, but it was also a, an attempt to uh, put uh, a Protestant work ethic uh, into those across the country and create a sober, sober and disciplined workforce and to deal with uh, the abuses of drink and neglect and, and poverty and the like. Also, there was a uh, kind of, especially an anti-immigration attitude that was part of this? Well, insofar as the temperance movement was concerned, it was directed primarily against uh, foreign immigrants and Canadian working class an attempt to inculcate uh, Canadian views in terms of drinking habits and Canadian cultural attitudes and beliefs. And it was a, a way to assimilate those that were arriving on Canadian shores 
through the temperance movement. And it was directed against specific ethnic groups. Um, one group in particular that it was directed against would have been the Irish in mm-hmm. Upper Canada prior to Confederation. Irish Canadians were seen as a threat uh, to the socioeconomic standing of, of those that were already living in the province. And under the guise of the temperance movement, the Irish were labeled as drunkards. And it was an attempt to sober up the Irish, but it was also an attempt to uh, maintain the status quo for those that were already living within the province so that the Irish did not threaten them economically. Mm -hmm. It was under the guise of temperance. So there was indeed a lot of social control that was going on. And it was imposed from above. I mean, primarily the temperance movement was a a movement of the middle and upper classes directed against the lower classes, but predominantly it was the middle class as they were carving out a niche for themselves in Canadian society uh, during this period of uh, influx of thousands upon thousands of immigrants arriving on our shores each year, starting with the Irish during the potato famines and then later under uh, the Wilfrid Laurier administration from 1896 through 1911 and his minister of the interior Clifford Sifton who was bringing in hundreds of thousands of immigrants each and every year as we opened up our immigration doors Mm -hmm. and it's it's to deal with the abuses of industrialization as well in the factory system that's part of what's going on here as well elaborate a little bit more on that well, insofar as uh, the factory owners were concerned, for example, uh, to lower their costs uh, and to maximize their profits in terms of in- insurance, the underwriters, such as Lloyd, for example, would uh, impose upon ship owners and, and factory owners um, higher insurance costs because of accidents that would come out of um, drinking, mm-hmm. loss of life, loss of, uh, loss of goods. And in a way to cut down their costs, they would enforce upon their employees that they become sober uh, during the workday, whether they were on board ship or working in factories. So you would see the beer factory boy, for example, disappearing from the shop floor, and you would uh, see an attempt on the part of the ship owners and the captains who work for the ship owners to impose strict regulations as it related to drink. Tell me a little bit about drinking establishments during this time. I am curious as to kind of the parallel evolution, if you will, and evolution is probably a poor word for it, but a parallel history there of the ways in which drinking establishments changed during this period and on up into the 20th century. Well, usually what happened in Canada was the tavern was usually the first structure that was ever built in any community. It was built before the schools. It was built before the churches. And the taverns performed a very important role in Canadian society. It was a place where people would assemble to discuss uh, debates uh, as it related to politics and what was going on in their local community. The taverns served as a a focal point for circuses that would come to the town. Um, Schools uh, were also uh, part and parcel of the the taverns. Um, Magistrates would hold court in the taverns, for example. And they served a number of functions. The only thing that the, temp- the taverns were not used for was for the temperance societies themselves. They absolutely refused to meet in them. They were also used as polling stations, too, uh, during municipal and provincial and federal votes later. Uh, and it provided amenities that weren't available for the average Canadian, um, a fireplace, furniture, a, a newspaper, if the, that individual happened to be literate. It was a place to assemble, to be there with your friends and treat them uh, to a round. It was a place for travelers to stop into and and have a drink and have a bite to eat uh, as they changed the teams for the carriages as they made their way across uh, the province, for example. Later, in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, the the, the taverns themselves uh, provided many amenities that the average working class Canadian did not have. Frequently, the tavern would have a public telephone where the average Canadian would not have one in their residence. There would be a public washroom available in the tavern, and that wasn't always the case for the average Canadian. And equally important, taverns have always been a place for the Canadian working class to cash their checks, their paychecks. Employers did not pay wages in cash, and the average Canadian worker was paid once a month. And since banks were only open from 10 until 3, five days a week, and the average Canadian was working 12 hours a day, six days a week, the tavern was frequently one of the few places that would cash your checks. So the men would go in there, get their 
check cashed, and then they would sit there and treat their friends, their co-workers, to uh, several rounds before they made their way home. And hopefully they made their way home with some of that money. Exactly. Uh, if they didn't, then they had to go another month before they were paid by their employer, which meant that their, their wives and their children suffered. Uh, they couldn't purchase clothing. They couldn't purchase food. Uh, they couldn't take a vacation. There was no disposable income. Um, so unions worked and, and fought for uh, empl- employees to be paid every two weeks in the system that we now have in place and to, to get their employees paid in cash instead of uh, in paychecks so that they didn't have to go to the tavern to uh, cash their checks. And this probably explains why so many women were involved in the temperance movement. It was a very practical uh, aspect of it, too, to get your get your man home with some of the money. Exactly, and to ensure that uh, that their husbands weren't coming home drunk and then taking it out physically on the women or taking it out on the children or neglecting the children and making them responsible. So there, there's certainly a, a moral component to, as it related to the temperance movement, but it's, why, it's part of the wider reform movement generally. That they are considered regenerators. They're regenerating Canadian society. So there's a religious and a moral component to it, uh, but it isn't strictly directed against <laughs> drink. There's there's other things that are going on here. Mm-hmm. The temperance movement was also trying to prohibit uh, the sale of tobacco, for example, mm-hmm. uh, in keeping men away from young single Canadian women uh, mm-hmm. because men were considered to be evil, particularly when they were drunk. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge! Moving towards the uh, latter half of the 20th century, there's something in Canada that happened that did not happen in the United States after the um, temperance movements and the prohibition uh, in the 1920s, and that was state-sponsored stores, state distribution, or provincial distribution of alcohol. We have a lot of listeners in the United States as well as here in Victoria, so tell me a little bit about... Uh, how that works here in Canada, and how it's beginning to change, especially here in British Columbia. Well, after Prohibition, um, the first province in the country to institute (coughs) uh, state-run distribution systems in terms of of liquor is concerned was Quebec, and British Columbia followed shortly thereafter. And it became a a program that was accepted by the provinces across the country, and and it was an attempt to deal with the worst of the abuses um, that we saw during prohibition itself the vice and the crime and uh, the profiteering and and the like it had been in the hands of the private sector before prohibition and that system wasn't working and the government took over responsibility for that and since the end of prohibition the government has found itself the provincial governments have found itself in this unusual position where they are both the distributor and the retailer for the liquor, but they're also responsible for regulation and enforcement, and they see themselves in this contradictory position. And what's now happening in British Columbia is that the the current administration is going to privatize that and will close down the state-run government liquor stores and turn it over to the private sector. So what you're going to see now is that so will be potentially a doubling in the number of liquor outlets that are available in the province where you can purchase your alcohol, and the government will still be responsible for regulation and enforcement. But it's a way for them to uh, rid themselves of the, the overhead costs in terms of wages that are paid out to the government employees, medical benefits and pension and the like, while, they can, while the government still continues to reap maximum profit through taxes and by ridding themselves of the overhead of the stores themselves. Uh, so they will turn it over to the private sector. So I think what we're seeing here is that the, that the system is coming full circle from privatization prior to prohibition and now 80 years later, turning it back over to the, to the private sector. Not sure what the hidden social costs will be for British Columbians as a result of this policy. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. 
but there are some definite potential problems there with the uh, with the system being more private. Uh, I foresee that there's potential problems. Um, some of the problems will be that you're potentially more than doubling the number of outlets, and that doesn't include bars and, and taverns, pubs, and the like. You're just talking about stores that can sell uh, liquor these days, mm-hmm. but potentially doubling. What's going to happen on the enforcement side? Is there going to be enough inspectors out there uh, making sure that the private sector is not selling to underage uh, British Columbians? What's going to be the hidden social cost for us with some bars potentially now being open till 4 o'clock in the morning? What will be the cost in terms of in- increased insurance cost to British Columbians through the Insurance Corporation of British Columbia? What will be the cost uh, to the municipalities in terms of enforcement with the police departments since the counterattack program, the drinking driving counterattack program has been scaled back and now bars will be open till 4 o'clock? What will happen to our medical premiums potentially? There's all sorts of potential hidden costs that are involved here, and I don't think um, we know exactly what's going to happen yet. And the argument that that British Columbians will benefit as a consumer because we will pay less because they're privatizing doesn't hold water if Alberta is uh, looked to because they've privatized their system. The only reason that Albertans pay less money is that there's no provincial sales tax in place. Uh, it has nothing to do with the, with the taxes on liquor. They're paying virtually what British Columbians are. So I'm not sure that the, some of these programs are going to benefit British Columbians. In fact, uh, it, it may hurt British Columbians. Now, there is some differences in the law between different drinking establishments. And um, here in Victoria, and I'm not sure whether it's in throughout the province or not, but we have neighborhood pubs. Right. And how is a neighborhood pub different from a bar or a club? Traditionally, what's happened with the with the the taverns and then the the beer parlor the beer parlors were as they were geographically concentrated. They were usually in and around industrial areas or downtown where the, there wasn't the that mix between residents and and customers. The neighborhood pubs actually went out into the communities. It was. Um, something that started to happen in Canada in the mid-1970s. It really took off in British Columbia in the early 1980s, uh, prior to Expo 86. And what that meant was that these pubs would go out into the communities themselves. They were smaller establishments. They started out with a seating limit of 125, and I think it was eventually cut to 65. There were fewer parking spaces available uh, for the number of seats in the establishment, which differed from some of the beer the traditional beer parlors where they had huge parking lots and seated anywhere from 300 to 400 people. And the neighborhood pubs were limited in their hours. Um, Closing time was, or last call was 11, and you had to be out the door by 11.30. The traditional beer parlors was, last call was at 1 o'clock, and you had to be out by 1.30, because the bars were in residential areas, and to cut down on noise and uh, traffic flow and the possibility of fights and so forth, they had an earlier closing time. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that this new legislation will affect uh, the neighborhood pubs in terms of their closing hours. I think what the government is looking at is having certain bars in the downtown core apply to uh, stay open till 4 o'clock, and then it has to go through a community review process. But potentially some bars in Victoria, Vancouver, and elsewhere could be open till 4 o'clock in the morning. And what sort of problems will that cause? Will we now have drunk drivers on the road at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning when people are, you know, the rush hour is starting and parents are getting children off to the daycares uh, as opposed to uh, a drunk driver at 3 o'clock in the morning in a, involved in a single vehicle accident where they've gone off the road and have only injured themselves but haven't injured somebody else. Yeah. So other potential hidden co- social costs. I want to just sort of end this with I asked you uh, before we did the interview to come up with a cool story from history that involved a drinking establishment so I'm ready to hear your cool story well we only had one rebellion in this country Uh, it was a not a revolution because it failed and in 1837 1838 there was the rebellions in upper and lower Canada 
and in Upper Canada, now presently Ontario, where the uh, armed rabble met before they marched down Young Street to uh, physically take over the legislative building was at a place called Montgomery's Tavern. So they went in and had a few drinks and steeled their nerves and got up a little artificial courage and marched down Young Street, uh, only to be back by the army and uh, the sheriff. And uh, within a matter of hours, the rebellion was over. And then the army marched up Young Street and uh, uh, shelled the tavern and burned it to the ground. Oh, goodness. So they failed after even after getting the... um the liquid courage to go down there. They actually didn't succeed in taking over the government. No, they did not. They failed miserably. Uh, any thoughts on whether or not the alcohol might have had something to do with the failure? <laughs> um, probably not related, but uh, it uh, certainly p- meant that the men were marching down Young Street to uh, prepare to do battle, but uh, when confronted with reality, they didn't perform very well <laughs> against those that were sober and better trained. There you go. Well, listen, I appreciate very much your time, and uh, especially since we ended up through technical difficulties having to do this more than once. Thank you very much. You take care. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. to First Person Plural with Dr. Patty Thomas and me, Carl Wilkerson. On today's show, we're talking about pubs and other places of social drinking. Before the break, Patty interviewed Sean Cafferty, 
a history professor at the University of Victoria on the history of drinking establishments in Canada. In this half hour, Patty and I will read some extracts from an academic style paper we are making available on our website. It is a short but gripping saga recounting a key moment in the development of quantitative methodology and the inspiration for the development as it happened was beer. Sit tight for the following excerpts from a paper called Tea Time at the Brewery. It is not uncommon for superior mathematicians to gain employment in industry and be charged with the valuation of their company's operations. On occasion, a theoretical advance will come about as a result of problems faced by such a mathematician. William Seeley Gossett, graduated Oxford in 1899, was hired by Arthur Guinness Son and Company Limited, and went to work for the company at the St. James's Gate Brewery in Dublin, Ireland. During the pursuit of quality control activities, Gossett became concerned with the issue of small sample size. Statistics was still in its infancy, and the precise nature of the relationship between population standard deviation and sample standard deviation was not known. Gossett, at the age of 32 and in the second paper he ever published, developed a distribution that reflected the difference between sample and population parameters for populations known to be normal. Gossett was required by brewery regulations not to disclose his real name on published work. He selected the pseudonym student, and the distribution has been known as the student t-curve or student's t-curve ever since. The normal curve had been derived rigorously by this time, but not knowing the standard deviation for a population being sampled and not having a reliable distribution function based upon a sample standard deviation combined to impose severe constraint upon the experimenter. Gossett's first attempt to deal with the problem was an empirical one. He obtained an existing data set composed of the heights rounded to the nearest inch of 3,000 convicts and their left middle finger lengths rounded to the nearest multiple of 2 millimeters. He then grouped them into fours and found the mean and standard deviation for each group. It didn't work well. Gossett then set to work on a method based on statistical theory and was successful developing the T distribution. The T curve is actually an infinite number of curves, one for every sample size greater than or equal to two. For finite sample sizes, the curve is not normal. It is like the standard normal curve, but is less centralized in its distribution. For increasing sample sizes, however, the T-curve converges to the standard normal. This convergence bears out the optimistic assumption on the part of earlier researchers that a large sample size would minimize the discrepancy between sample and population standard deviation, allowing use of the normal curve with a sample standard deviation without perceptible inaccuracy. Gossett's assumption of normality is not unjustified. Normal and near-normal distributions were showing up with increasing regularity in various fields of research, a fact that was itself partially responsible for the rigorous development of the probability density function that replicates the normal curve. Moreover, several other distributions approximate normality for large sample sizes. It may surprise the listener to discover that Gossett's paper was not dubbed an immediate classic by the mathematical world. Gossett's paper lacked rigor, but a better explanation of its lukewarm reception was that statistics was not universally accepted as a worthwhile field of inquiry at this time. A deterministic bias, a product of the previous 500 years of scientific history in Europe, was perceptible in mathematics. And as statistics was to mathematics, sampling was to statistics. Quote, Statists and statisticians were almost unanimously distrustful of sampling and emphasized at every opportunity the importance of complete enumeration. To rely on an incomplete survey was to become dependent on conjecture, a procedure the statisticians associated with the discredited political arithmetic and an obligation from which they had thankfully been absolved due to the massive expansion of official statistics. As late as 1901, Ladislas von Borkowitz observed, correctly, that the degree of exactitude of inferential calculation had been little investigated in social statistics. 
close quote. This from page 236 of Theodore M. Porter's The Rise of Statistical Thinking, 1820 to 1900. Let alone any statistics gathered in a cause perceived as less important, such as brewing beer. Statistics pioneer Carl Pearson, with whom Gossett had studied for a year prior to the development of the T-curve, was unimpressed by Gossett's accomplishment and wrote to Gossett saying, quote, only naughty brewers, close quote, would use such small samples in the first place. Gossett was not chastened, writing to Pearson that, quote, if I'm the only person that you've come across that works with two small samples, you are very singular, close quote. Eventually, a formal derivation of the T distribution was assembled by R.A. Fisher. However, he did not find it necessary to get it published immediately. By one account, the proof existed in 1915, but was not published until 1925. Fisher did use Gossett's innovations in his development of the F statistic. Evidence of Gossett's academic credibility and helpful to his popularity. Gossett's employers were even more tolerant. The T-curve has been used at the St. James Gate Brewery ever since that time. Today the T-curve is an integral part of any introductory statistics course. The practical consequence of a small sample curve has made it an indispensable element in the construction of a unified paradigm of uncertainty theory. The misgivings of the pure mathematicians of the 1800s and early 1900s regarding probability and statistics as a suitable milieu for formal mathematical analysis have been eradicated. The 20th century was marked by the increasing collection, availability, and utilization of numerical data in the hard sciences as well as the social sciences. The T-curve was a timely and accurate addition to the growing body of statistical knowledge and is established as essential in both practical and theoretical contexts. The police state is using its phallocentric organ, the corporate media, to control ordinary people like you and me. I'm fascinated by the large number of names people have for places of excessive drinking. Well, not just excessive. For well, drinking, period. Optimally excessive drinking. <laughs> the way they structure it, the place you're supposed to come home from early, the place you're supposed to stay all night. But in the States, the linguistic splits aren't as great as they are throughout the rest of the English-speaking world. But we did have after-hours places, which were places you went after all of the respectable bars, I suppose, closed down. This usually at about 2 in the morning. But apparently there was a legal distinction between the two.
and it's a linguistic split that I think underlines the, dare I use this term again, social construction of the activities in question. Well, certainly is an interesting taxonomy, if you will. I hesitate to use that word, but it really clearly shows differences between the United States, Canada, Great Britain. We're using the same words, but the taxonomies are different. It's more interesting to me to think about a, a pub or a tavern being a social center, being a place where people can come and do other things besides drink, do things that enrich the community. In fact, it can become a center of community. And it may be a reflection on my own disposition growing more and more sour over the uh, last 20 years, but I noticed a sort of diminuendo in that respect in the United States. Bars went from being places where, of course, you went to socialize to, of course, you didn't socialize. Or they were meat markets, places where you went to pick somebody up. By the end of it, I don't think they were even meat markets anymore. I think the idea was you went there, you didn't talk to anybody, and they drained you of your money, and you left. And if you happen to consume alcohol to excess in the meantime, well, more power to you. But that wasn't the manifest function of the place. The manifest function was the owner took your money. And the idea that there might be something in that for the consumer, like, well, other than alcohol, kind of went missing. Even the term lounge, which is another one that we hadn't brought up. Oh, yeah, lounges. I totally forgot that one. That's one that gets used a lot and in a lot of different contexts. It evokes, well, it evokes piano players and really bad music in my mind. As long as you're pursuing the linguistic tense of meaning, I would say it also invokes women's bathrooms. I oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> back in the old days when theaters were more ornate than they are now, there would be the men's bathroom and the women's lounge. The ladies' lounge. Oh, excuse me. But the word lounge is what I'm concentrating on here. And they used to refer to bars as lounges to give them a hint of respectability, the notion being that it's a place where you stop off to socialize and perhaps drink as well if you feel like it. And the emphasis was much more on that. Somewhere around the late 80s, that changed. That was the point in time to which I would assign the change. It went from being a place where people went quite naturally to associate with each other to being the place where people quite naturally went to avoid associating with each other. It was a place at which one quite naturally avoided associating with anyone else. Do you really think so? I mean, I think that when I go to pubs, restaurants with bars at them and so forth, it always seems to me like there's more people talking to each other sitting around the bar than anywhere else in the restaurant. I mean, it seems like people do go and sit and talk, at least to the bartender, but a lot of times with each other, that there are things happening. At, I mean, dancing is one thing that happens at places like that. Live music is another thing that happens. Darts and billiards and games playing, trivia, those kind of things. I'd say the subjective element is stronger than usual in this case because... I did a fair amount of drinking in the 80s, and in the 90s, I did almost none. In fact, I did none after April of 1990 because my stomach was wrecked. And it might just be that that was the date at which my disposition started to turn sour, to use my earlier terminology, ah. to wit that one enjoys the enterprise more if one gets into the spirit of the thing and less if one does not. So I was still going to bars and bar restaurants and that kind of thing, but I'd order a pop and sit around and... Uh, be sore about the fact that my stomach was uh, wouldn't permit me to do anything stronger. So there might be a little bit of interaction effect there. We'll have to include that in the write-up. Uh-huh. <laughs> Why is it, though, can, do you think we don't have centers of culture where people can go and just sit around and gab or have meeting places or do all of the things that the tavern did the way that Sean Caffrey was explaining it when he was talking about the taverns of the turn of the 20th century, where all sorts of things happen in this one meeting place. Why aren't there cultural centers like that anymore? And I wondered the same thing when I got old enough to drink. I was under the impression that all of the association that people must be doing must be at the bars. And that was sometimes true and sometimes not true. 
But where it's going on nowadays, I really don't have a clue. Salons have started to salons have started to come back, at least in name. Most of the salons that I know of are very formalized, and they don't have they have people coming and going all the time, and they're not neighborhood. And so, so suddenly it's newsworthy or exceptional when people get together to talk about anything more intelligent than uh, uh, when the Canucks play at home next. But that's my point: is that it's like very structured and. That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is how come it is that people who live within a certain neighborhood don't have a specific place that they go to now to hang out and know your neighbors. We all kind of go to our little boxes and stay in our little compartments. And when we do go out, we go out with a set number of friends and we stay at our little tables and ignore everyone. Well, the pessimistic answer is the one that we've hit before on previous episodes, that people within the same zip code have a great deal in common with each other and yet do not associate with each other. That might be it. It might simply be that the people you are most like are your competitors or a man is a wolf to another man or however you want to phrase it. And that finally came home to roost with a vengeance during the 90s. But a more optimistic approach might be that people don't associate along geographical lines anymore. That specialization of interests is advanced enough, pardon me for using the teleological term, that that is the way people organize now, to wait you don't associate with people from the same zip code or the same neighborhood at the neighborhood pub. What you do is associate with the other anglers in the crowd or the other sci-fi fans or what have you. And you and might not even... They come from more remote areas because transportation has improved somewhat. And communication. Yes, you might also be doing your association in a chat room on the internet some night rather than in a bar down the road. Do you think we've lost something by doing that? I think face-to-face -face contact counts. I think that's the real issue. And it's unfortunate that people are so suspicious of each other now that they won't put up with it. I'm not naive enough to say that the suspicions are not grounded. Well, that they cannot be grounded. But I think the solution must have been and will have to be something other than never looking another human being in the face again as long as you live. It almost seems like people do that nowadays, that they just sort of have a very narrow, I don't want to say view, but what I mean is tunnel vision. They have tunnel vision when they go down the street. They don't pay attention to the other people around them. It's kind of yeah. sad. And they have reason to, to behave that way. But at the same time, I feel like the way to deal with it is not to treat the symptom, but to treat the disease. It's interesting, too, that we've sort of come down to this because there is a professor of history who has written a book about sociology who, and the history of sociology, who suggests that the birth of sociology came from people who lamented the breakdown of face-to-face -face communication, people who were lamenting the breakdown of a sense of community. So in a way, sociology as a discipline was created in response to this kind of industrialized alienation that we're talking about, this kind of not knowing your neighbor anymore because you're too busy doing your work, too busy keeping your interests, too busy being specialized. So I think that sociology might have a lot to offer here. You have been listening to First Person Plural, because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for community radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues.
Music for first person plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about first person plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com.